When Don Foote was a young man, he was just uh, probably eight or nine years old, just young kid, and two roosts showed up at their house one day and talked to the grandfather, and he said, listen, I'm going on a ride, and I would like some company. Do you care if uh, the, the papoose comes with me? And he said, no, I, I don't care. That would probably be good for him. So he said, you, you need to tell his mother and his father. So he talked to the father, and the father said, yeah, that's all right. So Don said he went out and saddled his horse and, and uh, got some grub and different things. And, and uh, two roosts lived above where we lived and so we had to stop at Turu's house and he stopped and got a bedroll and threw on the back and and uh, a couple of other things and tied to his saddle. Well anyway they came across Mountain Home and they dropped down into Rock Creek. By the time they got down into Rock Creek Turu said Don he says are you hungry? And Don says yeah I'm I'm hungry. And he says okay let's build a fire and he said they got rocks and made a fire pit put some and he said, now you keep this fire burning so we got some good coals and I'll be back in just a short while. So he said, about a half hour passed or so, or maybe 45 minutes, and here come two roosts, and he was carrying a rabbit between his fingers by the ears. And he says, okay, let's, uh, we're going to cook this for dinner or for lunch, whatever time it was. So he said, we went over by the creek, and right in by the creek where we wanted, he said there was a kind of a bench of real thick, heavy red clay there. He made me dig a, a big handful of that big red clay out of there, a big gob of it. And then we took it back, and he said, and then we just packed that rabbit. I give it to him, and he says he packed that rabbit in a big, thick layer of red clay about an inch thick. So it was just a ball. Then he put that clay in that in those coals. It was real hot. And then he just covered it up with dirt. He said we just sit and talked about different things and didn't relate much uh, to it. But he said about a certain amount of time passed. And he said, "Well, he said that, that rabbit ought to be done." So he says he got a big stick and he rolled that uh, ball out of there and he said it was just hard like a, like a ceramic almost almost he said he rolled it out and he had a, a log about three inches around and about three feet long and he says he smacked that ball and he says man that steam just come out of there just like a steam cooker he says, you wouldn't believe it and he said he reached over and grabbed that rabbit by the ears, but he had to keep flipping them because it was so hot until he, uh -huh. he could get it cooled enough where he could grab that rabbit by the ears. Then he grabbed it by the back, and he kept just jerking until finally it broke away, and he says, and the entire skin come right off. Huh. Uh, legs and all, just right on down. He said, and there was just a bare rabbit, and he says, and the guts fell out. He says, he cooked that rabbit with everything in it, guts and all. Huh. He says, you know, that was the juiciest, and the uh -huh. best rabbit that I have ever really? tasted in my life. And he says, well, I've ate a lot of rabbit, and I've raised them. And he said, but that's the best rabbit that I'd ever ate. Uh -huh. After we got done, he says, okay, it's time to go. He says, so we went up this draw, got up near the top, and he says, we're, we've got to turn off here. So he says, I had no idea where we were going. And we turned off. And then we went up a little further, and he says, and we came to this lake. And when we got to this lake, he just pointed. Right, there's a spring there where the water comes out of the hill, and he pointed right there, and he said, there's gold right there. And he said, I looked at it, but I didn't see any gold. So all I could see was a lake with some water and some red dirt, kind of. He said, I didn't see any gold. I didn't really know what he meant. He reiterated it. There's gold right there. So he said, then we went uh, up just uh, 
a little further, not, maybe not more than an eighth of a mile. And he said, then we turn north on an old trail. We followed that old trail till we got on top of the mountain. And then he said, we went down over the other side of the mountain, headed west towards Hannah. He said, when we got on the other side, we had to go down this canyon, and boy, it was rough. But he said he knew where the trail was. So I followed him. When we got down to the bottom, he said we turned north again and went quite a ways up, but not too far. And he said then we turned east and went up this mouth of this uh, kind of a low sloping hill area and stuff and he said you wait here and he said he got off of his horse and he walked north and he went over a hill to where I couldn't see him but I'm just sitting on the horse watching and here he comes back he didn't say anything to me but he was carrying a piece of sagebrush just maybe two feet and had a not a not a big piece but a piece of sagebrush and he had the hand like a handle of a broom in his hand and he got on his horse and we rode on up he said when we got up uh, there's a spring there and he says you water the horses right here and he said don't you follow me you wait right here. I said, okay. So he said, uh, Turus then took walking north into a horseshoe, kind of a horseshoe affair. And uh, really, he says, if after I got older and I looked at it, it was looked like a question mark backwards. Uh, uh, no, not backwards, a regular question mark. Uh, and the spring was coming out of the bottom there. Anyway, he said, I waited, and I waited, and I waited. He was gone quite a while. And he says, I got kind of uncomfortable, and he said, so I kind of started walking in there. And he said, I didn't get in there 15 or 20 feet when all of a sudden he tapped me on the shoulder from behind. And he said, I thought I told you not to come in here, not, not to follow me. He said, I tried to explain to him that I was scared. And he says, well, you just do what I tell you. And he says, so we left the area. And he says, when we got about 300 feet above the spring, he said, we was going through an area where there was multicolored clays, about an inch thick, that they was layered in each things vertically. And you could see them on the ground, and they were sticky. And we, we went through this, and he said, when we just got in that area just above that multicolored clay, then two roosts threw that sagebrush down. And he said, uh, what did you do with that sagebrush? How come you had it, and then you threw it down? He said, me wipe tracks, nobody see. So he said, we went on up. And he got on another old trail going up on the north side of this canyon. And he knew right where he was going, but he says one place was a real steep place. And he says, uh, you'd almost think he's going to fall off the horse going up. But he says, we made it. He got up on top, and, and Turu said, uh, we're going to sleep here. So he says, we... Uh, I undone my horse and, and uh, tied him up uh, like you'd normally do, and I got my bed rolled out and loaded it, ro rolled it out. And he says, we ate some jerky and we talked, and blah, blah, you know, dry food that we had. Then he said, uh, two roosts, just before it got dark, went over to his horse, didn't undo the sa saddle, and he snubbed that horse right to a tree, right tight, so the nose didn't move more than an inch. And that horse had to stand there all night long up against that tree. And he says, and then two roosts went over and sit 
up against a tree and then just threw his blanket bedroll over the top of him, closed his eyes and went to sleep sitting up. He says, uh, of course, I went to sleep. Next morning, he says, I got up, looked around, and two roosts was nowhere in sight. And he was gone, and I didn't know where he was. We was right on top of the ridge. But he said, about a half an hour later, here, here he come. He said, I had no idea where he was, whether he was out using the bathroom or what was going on. But when he got back, he walked over to me and says, hold your hands out. So I held my hands out. And he had a little leather poke. And it was about two inches around and about five inches long. And he dumped into my hands three different kinds of gold. One kind of, one was just pure nuggets. The other gold was kind of a grayish type rock and one was brown that was honeycombed and it had gold running all through it and another piece was a layer of sandstone a piece of sandstone with a layer of gold layered on side of the sandstone about three eighths of an inch thick and he said boy that was heavy that was and he said after i had it there he said this is the Rhodes gold then he put it back in his pouch and I looked over to his horse because when we went to Two Roos' horse I seen him roll a little leather pouch up on some strings on his saddle and I looked over there and that leather pouch wasn't there so I know that he used that leather pouch and he got that gold at one of those three places that we stopped either down low in that horseshoe or up on top or maybe all three because there was three four different kinds of gold and uh, he said so then we come home uh, the next morning we rode got home and of course the first thing I done is I run over and I told my grandfather and my father about what had happened well, of course, Dad and my grandfather, who were good friends of two roots, run right over and said, show us the gold. Show us the gold. We uh, Take us there and show us where you got it. He said his words to my father and my grandfather were, me already show papoose, no savvy. And he refused to take us, uh, take them over anywhere. Well, of course, then my dad got after me and... Uh, I took them back up and I took them to the lake. They got, they dug in the dirt all around this spring, everywhere in there with shovels and stuff that they brought, little shovels. They couldn't find no gold anywhere. And I don't know what he meant. He just pointed right there and said, there's gold there. So uh, I took them up and uh, when I got into this one area, he said, uh, there's, a pl- there's a place here, and I had forgot to put this in the story, so I'll put it in here now. And stopped the first place, and he walked over the hill that I told you about. Well, they, he rode the horse up about, uh, oh, I would say an eighth of a mile above this orange knoll, or these orange-colored knolls that was in there. And he says, he stopped... And he says, you wait right here. And he said, uh, two roos got on his horse and he rode around this knoll three times with his horse. Then he got off his horse, he got up and he sat on the knoll and he folded his arms. And he sat there for a long time. Finally, he got, got down off of the knoll and come down, got on his horse, and that's when we went up to the horseshoe. But I showed my grandfather and and my dad everything, and uh, he says they looked and looked, and they went back for years after that and never could find anything. So uh, whether he got that gold out of a cache or whether he got it on the things, I don't know, but this is where he took me. Well, of course, Don took me up there and showed me everything showed me everywhere that two roots took him to the different colored clays and the horseshoe and and 
these places are there. The second trip that I made in, I went in and I took a friend of mine in, Cecil Dalton, and I showed him what Don had showed me. Well, Don was Cecil's brother-in-law, but Don wouldn't show Cecil anything because they had a family feud kind of thing going, and Cecil had been doing some things in the family, which I'm not going to say on tape, just suffice it to say that Don didn't like it. So he wouldn't tell him nothing or show him nothing, but he'd come to me. So I took him up and I showed him, and we stopped this spring, and I, I leaned down to get a drink. And when I did, my eye caught a white object hanging between two trees, and it was the thigh bone of a cow hooked to a wire. And when I looked up in the other tree, there was another wire coming down. So I pulled them together and wired them together, and this mar- but this bone had been hanging in a marker between these two quaking asps, and the tree or the wire was, of course, nowhere inside on the quakies because huh. they had been there so long, so many years. And I uh, undone that bone and I brought it out. Uh, when we left. Well, I went up uh, just a little ways up into that horseshoe, and when I got up in there, I'm looking around at all of these rocks, and there's a rock like a ledge there, and I look up, and there's a C that's carved in the top of that ledge, and you couldn't do it if you didn't have a ladder or something, you couldn't get up there, it would be very difficult if you was on the horse back of a horse standing there to carve that C in the ledge. And But you could possibly get on top of it from the back, I figured, and go over the top and carve that in. So we went around the back, and I, I'm looking around there, and there's this tree there. And this tree has a woman's name on it, 1926 something Montgomery. And I'd never heard of her or anything, but she'd been in there and was right behind this rock. Well, as I'm looking at the rock, there's a hole that went under the rock. And I looked in there and it was just piled full of of, uh, twigs and branches and stuff. And I told Cecil, I said, what is that? What do you think that is? Somebody's pushed in there. They said, oh, that's not an old pack rat nest. That's nothing. I said, I don't think so. Some of the branches look pretty big. He said, that's all it is. I said, well, I'm going to dig it out. He said, do what you want. So I dug it out. And when I got into the back part of it, there was a shovel. The shovel was about three feet long. And on the handle was carved a C with a line over the top. So I brought that shovel out, and uh, I give it to a friend of mine in Ogden named Wayne Nelson, because he wanted to look at them, and I uh, give him the bone and the shovel, and I never did get them back. Um, I've never went to talk to his wife, but Wayne is dead. I should probably do that, see if he has my shovel and that bone. But anyway, I figured that bone was a marker to turn in there, because that's where two roos turned when he told Don to wait and not to follow him. And then that shovel being back there, you know, why would a shovel be hidden back in there? Uh, C carved on a ledge. Uh, There was no CBR, but there was a C, and it was not big like six inches like they talked about in the trees. This was about two inches, and uh, just big enough to fit on the handle of a shovel, the C. So... Uh, that's the story about this area. Now, if you can make any connection between what I've told you about Wobbin taking me up yep. and Two Roos taking Don up, when Two Roos took Don up, naturally, he said there's gold there. Those 15 boxes that Wobbin told me about is the same gold that, that uh, Don was showed by Two Roos, but he didn't tell him that they was out in the lake. That's where they were, right close to that spring.